Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, today I'm going to interview Colleen Kiber, who is uh, my mentor. And back in April, she introduced me to a painting style, uh, which she called at that time uh, Rocky. And she was, uh, she told me how she did it and so on. And the Rocky, the image that's behind her, uh, right, right forehead there behind her is one of the images that she had done. What I wanted to do for this interview was to understand what the origin of this artistic practice is and uh, what she knows about it, what Colleen knows about it. So without further ado, let me introduce Colleen Kiber. So go ahead, Colleen. Yes. Well, I'm happy to tell you about it. I'm really very fortunate that this crossed upon my path. Um, Rocky was a, a 93-year-old woman in hospice. And she was uh, a, she, uh, a student of mine, was reading to Rocky because she had become blind. And uh, she um, told the student that she actually had a deep yearning to write, uh, that something that she had discovered she thought should be written down. And since becoming blind, she realized that she was not going to be able to do that herself. And so she asked my student if she knew of anyone, and my student thought that I would be the person. So um, I quickly called Rocky, knowing that time was of the essence here. And she was very bright and very receptive, and she was so deeply appreciative of the opportunity to be able to tell what she had discovered as an artist. Uh, Rocky was an art major at Stanford University, so as an educated professional and a professional illustrator of children's books who, who her daughters have um, published. So she knows what she's doing with art. She had a, a deep appreciation for Nolde, uh, Emil Nolde's work, and uh, there happens to be a beautiful collection of his work. Uh, at Santa Clara University. Nolde uh, was a German artist who suffered during the Second World War. Prior to the Second World War, he was very famous, uh, well-known and well-published well artist. Um, but the Nazis uh, destroyed his work and threatened him. So he and his wife moved north, um, I think all the way to Finland, and found a farm in which there was a secret room in the middle and a tiny room in which he made tiny paintings on watercolor paper five inches by seven inches hmm. made these paintings that are that were in intended and did in fact eventually become oil paintings he felt that he was just making his early sketches but they're so precious that they are now published in the and the collection uh unfinished unfinished paintings is what they are called. Um, they're in the collection in Santa Clara University. So Rocky spent hours looking at those paintings um, and loving them. Um, back to her own life. Uh, Rocky married a man who was a monk who left his order for them to become married and they had six children. In the evening, he, after the children were down, he would read to Rocky, often things from Carl Jung. As he was reading, Rocky would lay out what she called a ground, and I think as artists we would recognize that, a, a basic ground on watercolor paper. And the, the ground would be of several colors usually, um, and without any thought in mind, to just lay the watercolor out and then to gaze at it. Now, this part of it is very important um, to sit with it and gaze 
and gaze until forms begin to come forth. They could be characters as well, but you let the forms come forth. Now, she makes a point that must also be remembered. Don't look away while you're gazing. You'll break it. You have to give yourself to the process so that it can come up honestly with as little ego as possible. Our ego getting in the way of making something of it. Instead, she gazes and lets the imagery come up, which is very much what Nolde was doing, she realized. Then, when you see the form, you see the image, you take a rather strong uh, black pen and begin to outline it and identify it and stay with that in a meditative state, which she would do for hours. And she warned that at first, the images that come up might be difficult, uh, as it was for me. I, my first image was a, a goblin that comes out of my shadow. And uh, I call it my screaming Mimi. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's a very good shadow image, um, which I can show you if you, you want, see if it's going to be in my book on this subject. Um, but the beauty of working this way. Mm -hmm. So we talked about why this was so important. And she said, this is really the job of the artists. This is something the artists can do. As Carl Jung asks us to go to the collective unconscious for our inspiration so that we can become a conduit because we're the ones that can do this. Of course, anyone who can do this that cares about the health of the unconscious um, and, and about the unconscious as a source of inspiration for your work would be interested in working this way, I think. So uh, we had four meetings in total, uh, two meetings, and then um, Rocky was moved. By the way, she was called Rocky by her children. Uh, she was moved to um, live with her daughters so that she could die with her daughters. And the last time I spoke with her, she was expressing her gratitude for having been able to get this out because she feels it's so important that artists understand this source of inspiration and that it is the job you know you can do your art and then there you have a job <laughs> and a political job and uh, this is what we must do to bring health to the collective unconscious and rocky died peacefully two days later after our last meeting Skip, do you have any questions about that at this point? Uh, so Rocky was her name. Was it her given name or her family name? I'm so sorry. I can't tell you. I don't have it right in front of me. You you could tell me later. I mean, I can add that to the description of the... Uh, maybe I can, add, I can show you the email Nolde book cover. Okay. It might be good. good yeah, that would run. be good. It's very available. Her name is Mary Fidelius. How do you spell the last name? Just like Fidelius, F-E-D-E-L-I-A-S, Fidelius. Her oh. name was Mary Fidelius, and uh, she was happy to take on the name Rocky because she said that her name, particularly as a young child, was so difficult every Christmas time. She was always the one that was chosen to have some kind of wonderful part in the Christmas pageant because of her name, um, that it was a bother to her. So she mm -hmm. took on her children's uh, nickname for her gladly. This is the um, book that she refers to, okay. Emile Nolde, Unpainted Paintings. Uh. And it's a, a charming um Here's an example of be careful for what might come up. Ah, yeah, sure. Yeah, so she, she could articulate them sometimes very much to that extent. And then sometimes just something like this that's so beautiful that he did. 
Yeah. Just so beautiful. And right. as she said, um, she could not have painted anything this beautiful herself. Oh. I know what she means, you know, the, the paintings that I've done. I could not have done it as beautifully as it came out working this way. Uh -huh. um, at times in my own work, um, I will have something in mind uh, that uh, now that I've done this a lot, I'll think um, I want to do something about the Yellow Mountain, the place that I visited in China mm -hmm. a few times. And um, it's a very meaningful place to me for a lot of reasons. It's, a, it's, it's known by the Chinese as one of the five sacred mountains in China. And so I think Yellow Mountain, well, I'm laying down my experience in Yellow Mountain while I'm laying it down. And then I gaze and gaze and think about my experience coming up. And that's where I begin to articulate it. And that's in this particular piece behind me. The other one is I'm wondering what's going on with the yellow ribbon, which is a symbolic image for me, a, a timeline that I use in my writing. And uh, the, uh, again, the- okay, So um, shall I, uh, I'm gonna put on the screen the image so that people, that's the one that you're talking about, right? I can put it on the screen and it'll be more meaningful if people see it. All right, so you wanted to do something about the Yellow Mountain. Uh, and... This is the red ribbon runs through it. I wanted to um, understand the experience of the red ribbon. And so I put the paint on thinking of all of the times that the red ribbon has been meaningful to me that I've felt uh, that there has been a, a stream of a red ribbon going through my life, particularly as I write about my memoir. Mm -hmm. And so I, I uh, first hit the cam the paper with the spots of the red ribbon. They were very light, and then I thought of all of the challenges that the times in my life when I was challenged came forth and that's where the large strokes of the blue came out and all the rest of it started coming forth. And then I just hit it with the, yes, this is the what the red ribbon did for me and uh, let it dry and then come back at it with that gaze and articulate it with pen and ink. Right. And... I could not have painted you know, if I had tried to paint a painting about the red ribbon, it, you, it would have. <laughs> it would have been impossible to do. It would this. have been a cartoon. <laughs> yeah, this is such a striking painting. Uh, I saw it live at, in your studio in April, and I immediately started to want to ask you about it. So and what the process was. So could you talk us through your process of how you went about doing that? Yes, I work with a, a large house paint brush, a three inch brush. I'm finding that that's really helpful mm -hmm. uh, when teaching it because if, if people try to work with a little paint brush, it's kind of, you can't get that feeling as Rocky said you have to use your whole body and and let the color go off the uh, the paper that the whole thing should really be covered uh, with color and use your arms use your whole body when you're laying that color down it's um then it's much more experiential and mm -hmm. I get out of my head that way right okay and so and then it was yeah. seeing just the little brown places and the little I usually will start with uh, something like the dark color like the uh, blue and I'll just articulate all the dark blue first okay so you're you're basically drawing a, a line around the color boundaries the boundaries yes. of, of the dark color yes okay and then I'll maybe go to a lighter dark color and I might just touch the 
read a little bit and then I'll go to something else again and sort of methodically go through it using articulation of different colors. But then I will begin to see a pattern like this sweeping up through, which I had no intention of that at all. But this rocky road, this sweeping, uh, I live by the ocean, this feeling of force that comes from below in our lives. Um, and then the many challenges, which are like big mountains mm -hmm. uh, that um, I've had in my life, you know, marriages and graduate school and children and on, you know, True. Uh, that's what the Red Ribbon is about. Okay. Very good. Uh, Thank, you. Thank you. And, and what... In your case, as you're doing this, what is it that made you stop articulating the color? Okay, what you, made me what? What was that to make what, me what? What What was it that made you on this image, let's say, uh, stop articulating the color? Because there's many color boundaries in in this image that you haven't drawn lines around. I think when I begin to see the form, which is so important, when I begin to see a form happening, like those, oh, I, you know, if I do the dark things and then I do the light things, and I begin to see, oh, there's this shape coming through the whole painting. If you step back then and look at it from a distance, you begin to see that there's form uh, and there's dynamic. Mm -hmm. And so then I'll begin to play that up. Um, I guess then I bring in my artistic sensibility of um, wanting some drive to be going on. Um, but I begin to find those lines that want to move through the painting. And, and uh, I find it's important to let some colors show through. And I articulate them that way like that brown that's coming into the water at the bottom of it, if you see it as yeah. water, mm -hmm. um, to try to be careful to let that be transparent, um, that you have some sense of dynamic then when you see perspective, you know, the distance, and then so that the blue comes in front of the brown but the brown yeah. still passes through it, you know. Those those are techniques that that one begins to develop when you do this. I have shown this a couple of times to people, uh, and interestingly, they see other things in it, and I'm ah. I'm, re I'm reluctant to tell you what those are. I mean, what I saw in this immediately when I was at your home was that this looked like a, a traditional Chinese painting, but a very special kind of Chinese painting, obviously not done in the style of the Chinese ma masters, but it, uh, the image reminded me of, uh, of many Chinese paintings I've seen over the years, of course, but yes. others, others have seen other things. I'm, I'm reluctant to tell you what they are. Uh, uh but and i'm not and i i think i won't here because uh, i think you should see what you should see in it and if i tell you what they are they'll you know they'll crystallize in your psyche and i don't want that i don't uh. want to do, I, don't, I don't want that to happen to you okay <laughs> and and therefore like any work of art and especially any work of abstract art, it, it means to you what it means to you. Mm -hmm. um, and I, of course, see your experience and what you're talking about uh, because of our friendship. But I also see other things and others have uh, immediately seen other things that... The, the, well, um, yes, I, I can tell you, the first time I showed my work in 
64 or five, I, I sold a, a painting that was a painting of a gate. It was a road that led up to a gate and there was no road beyond the gate. I thought it was a, a rather clever idea of this road leading up to the gate, but the mystery of no road behind it. Mm -hmm. And so I <clears throat> sold it to a woman. And as she walked away, a friend came up to her and she said, oh, I see you bought a painting. The woman showed it to her and her friend said, what is it? And the woman said, a chair. And off they went, miss my clever idea. Oh my goodness. <laughs> okay. So I happened to have a slide of it. And when I went home and looked at it, I could see how she could see that. Uh, mm. And I've often wondered if she ever looked at it one day and said, my God, that's, you know, that's also uh, a road. So anyway, that, that uh, kind of thing does happen. Yep. But uh, on a deeper level, um, when I was still painting in a what I thought was a realistic way, and sculpting, this very much affects my sculpture, by the way, because mm -hmm. I sculpt now the same yeah. way. Um, take the clay and see what the clay has to say, just like take the paint and see what it has to say. Uh -huh. But one of my best favorite teachers, Nick Yank, a Dutch, Dutchman, who um, really understood painting abstract paint, uh, said to me, Colleen, you say too much. You don't leave enough for the viewer to play with so that their imagination is also ignited. Yeah. So yeah. when you tell me that other people are seeing other things in it, and that makes me glad that I haven't said too much, you know, that other yeah. people can play with it. Right. Now I'm going to just put it up one more time. So basically the technique, though, is to put down the basic ground of color, various colors, yes. and then and then draw... Lines. Gaze, 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 gaze at it, gaze at it, gaze, gaze, you gaze start... for five, ten minutes. Yeah, yeah, or maybe longer, I would say, but it, but anyway, to uh, gaze at it and start to see things that come through, uh, and then to start articulating the color by drawing a, a dark line between the colors, correct? Yes. At yes. the boundary of outlining, color. Outlining tends to be my technique, outlining the colors. Right. Okay. Which and, is a rather Chinese or Japanese look, I know. And then in your case, you chose to stop at some point. Would you say again why you chose to stop articulating colors on this? You know, it's a why is a uh, good question. Uh, because I'm, I'm always asking that question of myself, um, because I'll go back in and work for days and days and maybe weeks on a painting. Yeah. And so as I'll still see more, I'll still see more. <laughs> and um, so that's, I could go back in and continue. I can see places now that I'd like to do a little bit more. <clears throat> so. Yeah, but you um, shouldn't, not on this one. It's enough. It's yeah. enough. Again, yeah. I will have said too much. <laughs> yep. Yeah. This one. This one is sacred in its in its own form. Now, the insight that I had when we were together was that this was a way of reading the unconscious, so in very much in the same sense that you read the unconscious in collage work my insight at the time when we were together in april was that that this would be a way to see the collect see first of all the un unconscious of an individual and also it would be a way of seeing the collective unconscious because we've yes. been we've been planning our event confluence23.org and we were planning already to work with collage to learn the collective unconscious what i had suggested and i think it was my suggestion i'm going to take credit for it for the moment anyway mm -hmm. uh, 
my suggestion was that let's do a large piece at the confluence that is 10 meters long uh, or eight meters, eight yards long. And we all work on this Rocky together. Okay. Yeah. We'll all, we'll all look at it. We'll all do our yeah. thing with it together as a means of explicating the collective unconscious um, that we would be able to see what was going on in our group at Confluence from a group Rocky. It's it's just such an exciting idea. I've never been able to do that, to think of that, to think of being able to see the what, what comes up in the collective unconscious of a group. Right. And and so it, it so happened that, you know, the universe had given me a three-month job as an art teacher, something that I never imagined that I would ever do in my life. Uh, I never took an art course, in, an art class in uh, art school. Uh, I never, or in my college, there were plenty of opportunities to do it, but I never did it. And it just never occurred to me that I would ever want to teach art. But because of my interaction with you over um, a couple of years, several years now, I got interested in in how uh, the the collage and the doodle, which is another technique that you use, yeah. uh, could be used to connect students with the collective unconscious and with their own unconscious. Primarily, originally, I was thinking their own unconscious. And so I had already, over this past school year, because I've been experimenting in various classrooms as a substitute teacher, um, I have been trying to do the doodle, and you and I created a, a, a lesson plan, which I have executed at least 12 times over the last year in art classes, and it has turned out incredibly well, and incredibly well, and that's how I got to this point where I was with you, and I knew I now had and I never expected that I would have 15 different classes of kids from third to fifth grade. So somebody, the universe gave me 300 children to experiment with all in one go. And um, so we had come up with this idea when we were together that maybe we could use Rocky as a way to clarify or bring up what was in people's unconscious. I, I saw that because I had seen what was happening with the doodle. And so I knew we didn't have to make pictures of things per se, but we could use something abstract to bring up a picture of the unconscious. And I had done that individually many times by, by the time we were together. And I saw that I could do it as a group. Okay, yeah. that I, I could apply that as a group. When I came back to Annapolis in April, I was coming back to my students. I still had two and a half months to go with them. And I saw the opportunity to do a collective Rocky. And uh, so the way I did it was, first of all, I taught them how to do an individual Rocky. So I I had every student, I, I bought 90 pound paper for all 300 students, and I bought special water, watercolor paper for that, or watercolors for them, which is liquid watercolor. And uh, I had them all do an individual Rocky. And then I then had them do a class mural, a class mural. Yeah. That would be competitive, and I and the prize was a donut party. Okay, now I was teaching in a in a school for impoverished impoverished children primarily. There were 
Uh, it's a Title I school, so that means children are very um, much families without means. So they were very interested in the donut party. And then in the process of that, I had them do a huge mural. And I had all, all my 300 students plus all the 300 students that were with the other teacher who was teaching pre-K to second grade, I had all those students uh, put paint on a large piece of paper, okay? And I, I wasn't quite as definitive as you were. Maybe I didn't listen well enough. Um, mm -hmm. But the way I was describing it to myself was, I just have to get paint onto this large yeah. piece of paper, eight eight yeah. yards long Something and three yeah. and a half feet wide. And uh, once I get paint on the paper, uh, then, uh, and I'll have all the students do that so that then they will all have taken an interest in this particular mural. And then I will have the older students start to outline um, do the outlining. I um, see. Okay. Right. Uh -huh. And so I, uh, over a four week period, I did this process starting with the individual up to the, up to the final work, because I saw them only once a week per class. So I just want to share with you. I, I know you've seen this, but I want to yeah. share uh, yeah. on, on this interview, um, what the result was. I was pretty pleased with it. So this is the final mural, okay? And so this mural had 600 students and probably 30 or 40 of the, of the school staff. That's wonderful, just put, wonderful. Put color down. I, I limited each student to one minute. I, I gave them paint and I gave them the instruction that they had one minute to make their mark on the school mural. I didn't let them just paint, 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 uh, because a lot of them wanted to paint it, yes. paint uh -huh. like painting a house. So I let them do whatever they wanted. And some of them put their initials on various other things. But, you know, in the end, this was the result after... I don't know, about three weeks of mm -hmm. of uh, putting the paint down. This is me and my colleague just to show for scale how large this thing was. Yes. And initially the guidance counselor, but uh, others as well, they were so moved that they insisted on using this as the backdrop of the fifth grade graduation. So I'm going to just share a couple more pictures here. They will understand abstract art. That's a generation that will understand abstract art, unlike my own generation. Yeah, you know? maybe. Okay, so here's the setup where the where the fifth graders were going to be facing the audience. And this is the piece uh, behind them. And uh, this is how big this was the whole gymnasium that was filled with chairs. So and it got swallowed up in that gymnasium. But wonderful though. Every, mm. Everybody liked it. Uh, do you have any comment about this? I mean, even the principal said, this is awesome. Well, it's, a, it's really amazing. It would be interesting to know which students could articulate something that was already there. And then which students would bring something that they added to it. Okay, well, and there, was... there would be those that brought something that didn't see it at all and just made their mark. You know, there are, there are three different levels of response to it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I'm thinking how interesting it would be. I, I hope that this is saved. You know, if they could look at it 10 years from now, what they would recognize is prophetic in this yeah that's that's a very good question and yeah. and uh because i was a substitute at that school i did not take it away 
I'm hoping that my counterpart took it away because then she ended up leaving the school also. So I don't know what actually happened to this. The but words, you know, the words that they've put in and how how it goes from being, I mean, even the unconscious is unfolding itself in a way here in terms of the um, uh, construction of it, that it's very murky at the left. I mean, murky in unidentified, mm -hmm. which would be the place of the most unconscious work. And they they t seemed to want to leave that alone, which is quite wonderful. And then if you just kind of move the camera, if you can, across this, yeah. um, then you see that there's this articulation that begins to happen, like the human being begins to arrive on the planet. Mm -hmm. And then they make more and more of a statement, more and more of a statement, so that the ego, the self becomes, look at this, artfully yours. I mean, it's just wonderful the way it becomes more and more in the present where we are right now and then we're going to start to see more of the future as we go off the the piece at the end the words uh that they have written in and it is not as murky there there's more articulation mm -hmm. uh, and then we go off into the future here more and more mm -hmm. so how that would look to them over time you know it would be quite interesting but just the way the self came forth in the middle of it you know is very exciting the way they yeah. respect the the, the uh, structure of the whole thing um it's just in us to do this yeah. well in fairness the artfully yours had been put there by my counterpart and her name was mrs s or Miss uh -huh. S. So she had written her name, Miss and S there. You can see the S. And I had written Art 2023. Oh, I see. There. Okay. Okay. And in the course of everybody doing their work, my three sort of got obliterated. And I had my name, Mr. Conover, here in my uh, artistic style of how I sign my name uh mm -hmm. calligraphic style and that got almost totally ob obliterated you can see a little bit of the c there and the m well that's fair that's fair and and yeah. all the same you see how articulated their marks are in the middle mm -hmm. compared to at the far end yep at at the left which is the most unconscious right part okay. and it's what that's what we do when we paint when we make a collage when we do something like this, we we the unconscious is off there to the left. Look at that. Look at that. Wow. Right. All right. Now one oh, there's one little secret trick here that I use. And that was that this left side had gotten so dark, it was really dark. Um, and so what I did was I after classes. Uh, I would rain on it, okay? So I would take a little bit of water and just drip it on. And so okay. the white, the, the very light areas here are where the water has pushed the color away. Uh, and uh, I also, the when it was laid out on a table, it, I had it um, propped up in certain parts. So you can see here in the center, that it this is sort of like a river that that got made when that happened that wasn't the mm -hmm. children that were doing that that was me uh or i you know the the almighty i said that i was anyway uh it, it was tremendous fun great fun and i don't know what does the what does the image say to you um you know, or or is it inexpressible? I, you know, I maybe it's inexpressible. Um, you know, I'm just I'm I'm just curious whether you have a comment on on what this is saying. <laughs> yeah, obviously, there's it's um, it is. If it's a expression, story, it's yeah, it, it's an expression of the collective unconscious of that group of children 
at that point in time. Okay, I would say that explicitly. And then... You have children doing this right. uh, who are part, who are still know that they're part of the stream of consciousness of human of humanity Absolutely. and the fact that it, it's like the the mural is like the story of humankind you know it begins they they avoided our tickling whatever you did and it got very dark on the left because right. they don't know about that and the unconscious is scary if they go into it and just as i said rocky said watch out get into the in there and you're going to get darkness so even though you don't tell them these things is what happens and just just the the fact that that happened to the far left if we go into the cave paintings skip we're going to see the same thing yeah we I'm did sure. the same thing on the walls in the cave paintings we started out with a very murky thing when you look at them and then the ego becomes more evident, more and more evident. And in the middle, bang, right where the self is, there it all is. Your your co uh, your co-worker, yourself, you put your marks in. That's where the human being has arrived. This is it. And the kids kept those ego marks apart. You know, they separated the images there. Yep. And then off into the future, they don't know where they're going, but they're still there in the future articulated yes. compared to the past so right. it's it says that they see themselves at some level they know that there's a continuum that they are on and they express okay. themselves on it it's, yeah. it's incredible it so, really is yeah so the, the thing i have to ask you is how do you spell rocky i love the way you spell it she spelled it r-o-c-k-y and uh, but you give a kind of Asian twist to it that I think is very nice. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm going to stick with my spelling. Um, okay. But that's interesting that she spelled it that way. Was there a reason that her children gave her that nickname? Yeah. Um, I want to, um, if you, I have a funny thing that happened. It's not funny, it's important. I had a funny, I had <laughs> Last week, a friend came to the studio who was going to be at the Confluence, and she hadn't seen my work for a while, but she knew that I'd been working with the idea of the Red Ribbon. I said, oh, uh, I did a, a painting of the Red Ribbon. And so I showed her what it is that we were just talking about, if you would put it up again. Yeah, sure. Um, uh... So... I realized that the Red Ribbon isn't... It's not just a smooth red ribbon that runs through life it has knots in it uh -huh. and i didn't understand that it had these knots in it but of course they are there in the painting and i articulated those spots and so she said you know what are those spots well those are the many knots in my life that i had to undo break tie untie mm -hmm. oh she says the madonna of knots the madonna of knots that she is... said, well, you know, there is a Madonna of knots. Uh -huh. There is. And in, there are many, many shrines to the Madonna of knots. Mm -hmm. And uh, if if you would look up, because a copy that I have of her, I can send, I'll send it to you. It's incredible. The Madonna of knots is like, if you took one of these images, we've got what? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven knots or we have three four five major times in my life when i untied knots but if you look at the painting of madonna of knots she is untying knots for people that are going through difficult times in life now i started this what a year year and a half ago mm -hmm. this is just last week that i learned about the madonna of knots Incredible. that's to me the connection uh being connected to the unconscious coming right. up and giving form well that that's another thing i love about this style is that these paintings are alive you cannot look at them the same way twice that it's not it's just not possible 
And it's one of the reasons why I wanted to make sure that you told us about this and why 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 how how large is that painting uh what was that how how large how how large is the paper that you use oh mine is um 24 by 30 it's 24 by 30 yes okay. it's a pretty big piece of paper big piece uh, of paper and as she says you should take the color off the edge of the paper so that you're really moving, let the color go all the way, which I did more so on the China piece, and I almost did that on the uh, right. The, the red ribbon runs through it. Yeah, incredible. Um, so there's one other thing that I wanted to show you, which is this um, backdrop that I have here, because since, since you and I have talked about that originally and this is only going back since april i started to do uh this work for myself only for myself not trying to make anything that was artistic okay or that people would like necessarily okay there may i may have done some that people would like my a uh, counterpart in teaching art told me I could sell these, but uh, it's not a priority for me. But I, but this is what I've been doing. Wonderful. And again, what I've done is I followed your rule of putting down a ground and then outlining the color. And, yes. And I've done it pretty pedantically. Uh, much more not not as flowing as you and uh it's interesting that there are a couple of analysts from the colorado area who i told about this and they started to do it and oh my god they sent me some fantastic pieces <laughs> and uh but anyway um yeah, I'll, I'll show you those pieces at, at the end if I have them because looks like a galaxy, right? Okay, but but I start to see things in these, and so this one, uh, which I have here in my hand, um, <clears throat> I um, I started. I'm, I'm just trying to orient it in my actual painting. Okay, I did, okay, so I now know what the orientation is. So I started this on the 11th of, of July, and I, I'm nowhere near done yet from my perspective. And what I've been doing is at the end of uh, a period of drawing these lines, I've been using this as a, as a meditation technique. And it's worked for me much better than any religious med meditation technique that I've ever tried. And I've done a lot of uh, Buddhist meditation specifically, but this totally absorbs me. And it gets to the point, if I sit down and I start to draw these boundaries, I'm actually strapped to the chair. I literally, I, I've been doing this early in the morning and I literally cannot get up from the chair for half an hour to go to the coffee pot and pour myself a cup of coffee. It's so absorbing. And so I know that I'm communicating with my unconscious. Yes. And, and I'm hearing things that I'm not going to say during this conversation at all. But But one of the things that I've been doing is I've been um, marking the the time. I want to orient this so that I have the, the orientation up that I want to talk about here first. All right, so this is mm -hmm. the original orientation. And what I've been doing is saying, okay, I'm going to see what I see in this and give it a name, which is part of your dictum. You have to give your artwork a name 
And so I've been doing that as a, as a progressive process. And so at 8.53 a.m. on the 11th of July, I looked at this and I gave it the name Like Father, Like Son. And that is because there's a very prominent nose here. Can you see my cursor as I'm doing it? Yes, yes. Okay. Uh -huh. So there's a very prominent cursor or nose here with a mouth. And there's another very prominent nose here that overlays it. And so originally I thought this was the father, but then this became even larger. And so the, the son has a green eye, the father has a blue eye. And there's more to it than that, but uh, that's mm -hmm. the name I gave it. And then yeah. I guess I was still staring at it because at 9.05, which was 12 minutes later, I renamed it Profiles, okay? So yeah. then... Um, it moves. <laughs> it moves. I, but then I discovered that if I change it, if I redirection it, um, and I don't know what these names mean to me yet, um, and you know, maybe the whole painting will mean something. Uh, I want to figure out where I'm going here. So, okay. So now I oriented it this way and um, I called this um, mother support when things get tough. And this was wow. two days later at 9.52 in the morning on July 13th. And the name I gave it in this direction by turning it is Mother's Support When Things Get Tough. Mm -hmm. um, and then if I go back this way, um, I'm trying to figure out what I said about each one of these. All right, so, uh, okay, so this way I called this, um the field of um the field of opposites yeah. no it's not this way that i said that but it's but it changes you know the point is that it the unconscious is like that and it's moving all the time right and you're it and then you change it you know a different right. direction right. in it has a different feel to it. Right. It's and very then, much like our unconscious is, you know, it doesn't have a, a conscience. You know, yeah. It's just there. And it, it has, look at all the energy it has. Yeah. All the and action so, it has. Right. And so this I called sad tears. Now, the other thing to point out about it is, um, and I think this comes from an instinct where we uh, would see eyes in the jungle in primeval times. Um, and so I am seeing uh, faces, many faces in these things as I'm doing them. So here in, the, in this orange fellow, you see his two eyes there and sort of a grimace in brown. Uh, that's one. Um, and as I turn it, uh, you see many more. Uh, mm -hmm. So um, here is sort of a evil guy looking down, and here is another. And if you um, move it closer, you see even more of them. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and so like even this guy is is one and here and here and and so and here this here's this guy with a gray nose who's looking downward um mm -hmm. and so on and here's a guy and i realized that you know somebody who wanted a, an original cartoon character could simply do this and an original cartoon character would emerge and then you could use artificial intelligence, not that I suggest doing that necessarily, but using that necessarily, but 
you could actually build out a whole cartoon series for years yes. on, on yeah. these totally original cartoon characters. I actually had one from uh, back long ago, back in April. I, I'm not sure I still have it. Oh, here. Is it? Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to show you one more because these cartoon characters just emerge from me. I, I realize, or from the process, it's not from me because I would never have thought of these. But uh, here, uh, you see this person with a green nose and a yes. and a smile, and this is their maybe their eye eyelash or eyebrow looking here, and yes. and so that's one character, and they're they're forehead goes off to this side but right below that character's chin there's this grimacing guy that this is the top of his head and you come down and here's his eye and his yeah. nose and he has this little mouth sticking out here and 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 so on so yeah. there's another character there um and then if i turn it upside down just a minute, just a minute. Let yeah, me. Sure. Uh, well, oh, sorry. Uh, I was going to say go back to the original, the okay. way it was. All right. All right. This is the so original. Stay, so if you stay with this, I wanted to say now, what if you have two characters here? Yeah. Let's stay with that. What are those two characters doing? What's the relationship between them? Like, do they, are they aware of each other? I, I'm not even sure. You know the the lower guy. He he looks like an eat more evil character, and uh -huh. and so he might be. He, this might be the sort of the peaceful part of him in it, in his psyche. Yeah, you know, sort of weighing him down, and he's not very happy about it. So he's looking up and grimacing. Now look at at the, what's coming into this from the upper right hand corner i see a character who is bringing yes see the face there yep, yes right there yeah yep. character is bringing a lightness a lighter pen yeah uh, uh, uh it's almost like a spirit is coming into the center and see the flower it's like yep. the character is offering something to this situation right and actually this is not finished finished at the point that I took this photograph but uh just you, to give you could just grab that dynamic right and and then instead of going round and round and round grab that dynamic and go with it and see what's what's going on here yeah because yeah. you have three characters here that have that there's an interaction I see right and what I wanted to point out was here's another character upside down if I flip it upside down or turn to the and and sometimes that helps to inform what's going on between the three of them very much now what happens when you turn it you know wait a minute one two oh i don't know why it's insisting to have it that way so i can't really show you what i wanted to show you uh let me see if i can get it all right uh no darn it um yes this delicacy delicacy is rushing in right um but there's another character i mean if you as you're looking at it right now i'm sorry i can't flip it correctly but as you're looking at it right now if you put your head to the right uh you see the image that we were just talking about if you turn your yeah. head to the left 90 degrees there's another character right here and mm -hmm. this is the mouth, and this is the nose, and this is his eyes, and hit the pupil of his eyes, and he's got this big I forehead, see, yeah. forehead here. And so when I was teaching the kids, and here's here's the image that you saw coming mm -hmm. down out of it. And so when I was teaching the kids um, how to do this. I I use that as an a, a, this image is an example. It sat on my desk for a period of time. Um, right. 
I want to make another comment. I'm Please. running out of energy to yeah. skip. Um, uh, I want to, but I do want to comment on the meditative state that you get into when you're doing this. Yes. You know, because this is very, uh, this is very right brain, and mm -hmm. uh, when we're meditating, that's what we're doing is accessing our right brain as much as uh, possible. Um, and that has a, a calming effect on us human beings, us homo sapiens. Um, but when I visited Japan, which I have often, and you know the Japanese culture, um, I visited the Omoto people who uh, believe that when we're doing our art, this is the highest state the human being gets into. And it's when we're doing this. Mm -hmm. And... Um, so when I first visited them, I asked them, so do you meditate? And the answer was, um, well, yes, if you want to, but it's better if you write a poem. Mm -hmm. They're very much into activating the unconscious. And this is the place where Aikido was born. So um, uh, tea ceremony wasn't born there, but they practice it religiously. Mm -hmm. um, but they go to the more the the shrine every morning to meditate and chant in order to prepare themselves to go to the studio. Mm -hmm. So the meditative state that we get into, from my point of view, is a preparation for us to create. Yes. As they say, God created us, we are obliged to create. We are obliged. So it's, so we get into that state, but then you're doing something and some information, you know, it's, it's just definitely a part of that realm. Well, and the, the dictum that I've been coming up with is that um, we're all creators. We all are creating our own life. And, and so the reason that you need to understand this, what you and I are talking about, is not because you need to replicate either one of our Rockies or learn how to do a Rocky. It's because the reason we teach art or music, let's say, in school or dance is not because it's, you know, it's going to pay the bills tomorrow, but because we're all creating we're all creators of our own lives yeah. and we have to understand that you know when i was interviewing with some of the parents of the teach of the children i said you know in elementary school i really want the kids to connect with that creative part of themselves uh, yeah. because the problem is that once you get to middle school and they start teaching you the digital palette so called the digital yeah. palette, then they're teaching you somebody else's life mm -hmm. and how, how that works. And so you're not creating your own thing. You know, that's the amazing thing about your art is that you have always created your own thing. And, it's um, a personal growth process. Right. 